Okay, welcome back. Hopefully you had a good break. Um, we still do have the conference rooms out in the lobby there. Um, some people were asking, hey, where can I plug in my, you know, my device? Um, in the middle of the conference room tables, there's a bunch of power strips so you can plug in there. If you need to take a call or something, you're free to go out there. I ask if you can squish into the middle um, to leave the aisle seats open uh, for those that are sort of popping in. We had a bunch of people standing in the back um, for a bit. And just a reminder, please don't sit on the, the staircase. Um, we're not allowed to do that, but if you could just grab a seat, that'd be perfect. OK, so with that, um, we're going to pick up our next set of speakers. Um, we're going to have Guan Zhu and Adam Montez from Google come and talk to us about Android UI automation. And with that, welcome, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Um, hi, guys. Um, my name is Guang Zhu. I'm Adam Montez. So we are software engineering tests working at Google on Android test engineering. Um, today, we're going to talk about uh, Android UI automation. So I'm so, going to step aside sorry. and let you <laughs> go ahead and, and, and finish the overview of the technologies. And I'll step back in, and I'll show you a little bit about the APIs All right. of the UI automator. Thank you. So before. Uh, before I start, I want to give a shout out to, I know there are teams both externally and internally have been trying this out already. And some of them have been trying before even we finalized the uh, API. And even after we final, roughly finalize it, I know we have some bugs or inconveniences here and there. So thanks for living with us through the somewhat painful process. Hopefully there's like more gain at, at the end. So let me just jump into the presentation. Uh, first of all, uh, what problem we are trying to solve? Um, uh, we thought about this before we started because uh, I think this helped us narrow down um, what kind of functionalities we want to provide through the uh, UI automation library and what things we want to exclude, or what things are better excluded as a separate uh, kind of like helper type of thing. So the way we see it, UI automation is access, inspect, traverse, and manipulate UI widgets of the application under test. Um, we see it as a control feedback loop. Uh, basically, the control piece is when you do uh, input event injection. And the feedback loop is when you do the UI inspection and see if the application is hitting the state that you want it or where the application is to decide what's the next step of your test. Um, so the APIs that we are providing is mostly centering around these two key pieces. Um, also, before we start, the another thing that we did is we did a survey on Android UI automation. Just look at the landscape, uh, what solutions are already out there. And um, we kind of like looking at the underlying technology and decide uh, what can we learn from it and how they can, uh, how we can benefit from their like pre-existing pre experiences. So with that survey, uh, we noticed that there are uh, three major trends. One is based on instrumentation framework. The second one is based on image recognition for UI inspection. The third one is something using uh, is using something called Android Hierarchy Viewer. Uh, I'll cover all these three pieces in the following slides. So, first one up is the uh, instrumentation based. Um, uh, hopefully, you guys already have some uh, notion of what instrumentation works, how instrumentation works on Android. Basically, it's a special thread. It's a special way of starting the application on a test with an instrumentation thread. So. Essentially, you live in the same process as the application under test. Um, so two key pieces. Um, the UI inspection is done through programmatic traversal of the view classes or the view hierarchies. And the event injection is done through the APIs provided through instrumentation object. And because, um, as the diagram, sh diagram shows, the instrumentation lives in the same um, uh, Dalvik VM, uh, same process as the application on the test. Uh, you have you can have direct access, and it's uh, based in the same process. There's no IPC going on, and uh, what you get is fast UI traversal, um, or and 
you can, if done pro uh, properly, you can go pretty fast. Um, and also, uh, it supports a large range of platform versions. Um, that's the API levels uh, that um, sort of briefly covered in the previous presentation. Uh, because instrumentation has existed for a long time, uh, going back to, I think, the first version of uh, Android. Uh, there are uh, some limitations to this approach. Namely, you um, cannot cross application boundary. Or I, sh I should say, more precisely, you cannot get out of the application on a test, because key injection only works inside the current application process. Uh, the instrumentation will not have permissions to inject key events sh if you wish to test a kind of end-to-end -end, uh, functional in uh, integrated level kind of test. So the next, the next approach that we uh, looked at is the image recognition-based approach. Uh, key technologies include UI inspection is done through image recognition. We take a screenshot of the device on the test, and we have pre-recorded test cases that says, uh, look for this particular piece, maybe of text or of a pre-captured like, region of button you want to click. And input event injection is mostly done through ADB shell commands. There's a ADB shell input command, or you can do it through emulator. I've seen approaches like you can, uh, sorry, you can also hit on the keys of the, uh, the emulator to simulate input events. So characteristics-wise, um, you don't need uh, explicit knowledge of what's the UI hierarchy on the t uh, in the um, application on the test. And you don't even need to sort of have a kind of like a rough knowledge of how the UI framework w works uh, because your test is sort of just text-based or based on I want to click this button, I take a screenshot. I, I take a crop of this button and I say I want to click it during the test. So also this works for framework standard widget or customized UI. What that means is um, some of the applications has pretty structured uh, application UI. We use buttons, we use uh, like some layout components on top of them to arrange uh, their relative positions. And But some uh, may choose to uh, do some, for a nicer user experience, do some fancier stuff, like I have a uh, like cover flow type of thing or carousel type of thing. Uh, those, those hierarchies are not directly exposed to the outside framework. And uh, with other tools, normally you just see a blank piece of view. Now, with this approach, you can basically say that, based on image comparison, you can uh, say, I want to target this particular region. Um, so there are some uh, shortcomings with this approach. Namely, uh, it may be sus uh, susceptible to theme differences. Let's say I have a bluish button background instead of you know, blackish. Uh, that also depends on how, how good the, uh, the image rec uh, recognition algorithm is. Also, there's a slower execution speed. Uh, because taking a sc uh, screenshot is kind of slow on um, devices, and especially if the device has higher resolution. So the third approach is hierarchy viewer based. Um, uh, basically, there is a tool called hierarchy viewer where you can use it to inspect your uh, UI hierarchy. Um, well, if you have uh, you tried that, you will see that uh, it will actually create a uh, representation of your UI on your host side, and you know, if you are tempted to do UI automation, you will think, wow, this looks great from UI automation standpoint, because you get to see everything inside the app. Um, and event injection is done through, um, similarly to the image recognition approach, you do ADB shell event injections. Um, the benefit of that is it works across apps, but it's kind of slow in execution. If you've used the tool, um, uh, you know it's kind of slow. Um, this is not blaming on the tool. This is because the uh, the amount of information exposed through the pipeline is just uh, quite large. Um, uh, another shortcoming is you may see invisible widgets. Like for example, if you try to see it off, uh, use it to see launcher, you may see uh, all home screens and all apps already included in the hierarchy, uh, which is bad because from a UI automation point of view, whatever is not, dis uh, whatever is not displayed on screen 
um, you cannot interact with it. Um, also, it may not work on customized views based on uh, what I just explained. And um, actually, there's another shortcoming is that um, you can only use emulator or a device that's rooted or with engineering builds. So, sorry, I'm going backwards. With that, uh, I would like to introduce our new tool called Android UI Automator. So the key technologies are we use accessibility service for UI inspection. Uh, we use, we talk to input manager for uh, event injections. Um, some, some of the character, characteristics includes we can work across apps because it's a complete, completely external approach. Um, the apps, uh, the test list lives outside the same process of the, the app. It's a complete external uh, entity, and it's meant to be as a sort of a black box approach. Um, also, it can be faster than manual execution speed. Basically, if you think about it, we are not living inside the same proce process as the app under test. Obviously, we cannot di directly poke at the states of the app. Uh, everything is done through IPC. Um, you know, th the benefit of that we get to work across processes. And the downside of that is, you, you know, uh, when you interact with apps, uh, you can't go as fast as you want it, but still it's faster than manual execution. Also, uh, you know, human beings get tired, right? So uh, the third one is um, the customized view. Uh, it's subject to the same problem as the other approaches, but we do have a traversal interface that for these views that they can implement and by implementing that, you actually get two benefits in one go. First is your app is actually more uh, accessible because that's what we are keying on, the accessibility service. The other is basically you get to interact with the, uh, what's inside the view that's originally not available. Um, the th fourth one is uh, we support API level 16 or higher. Um, I, I just want to Expand, explain more uh, on the API level thing because that was asked earlier in the Q and A section. Uh, basically, API level is what we uh, uh, so Android framework provides a set of APIs, and over over platform revisions, we evolved API by providing uh, more API calls, more functionalities. Um, a key promise that we are making is it should be always backwards compatible. Basically, if you compile an app uh, targeted at a lower API level, let's say 10, it should be able to run automatically on API level 10 and higher. Um, every time we make an API, uh, we make an API change, we will increase API level. But it, that's not that's not saying that we add new new function, we increase one API level. That's not how it works. Basically, we have release cycles. Every time we release a new platform, we have a new platform release. Um, you, you know, like Gingerbread, Gingerbread, MR1, mm, MR2, I think we have four MR, that stands for mainline release. Um, uh, API level 16 maps to, I think, 4.2.0. It's more of a product release thing, I don't really remember. But, but basically, Jelly Bean equals API level 16 or higher. This is because we have underlying um, uh, framework dependencies. I also get asked about this a lot. Like, this is a great tool. Can you guys backport the changes? Uh, the answer is not really because there's no way for like all the deployed devices we go back and update their framework to support uh, the UI automation. Um, the, the last point is I want to make is we have a CTS, which stands for Android Compatibility Test Suite, that uh, checks that the device supports the underlying accessibility layer so that uh, we guarantee that the, the uh, we, well, we want to make the guarantee that the, 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 the framework will work on API level 16 or higher. Uh, you know, if a device, regardless if it's a Nexus device from Google or OEM devices, say, from Samsung, LG, uh, ASUS, and so on and so forth, they should always support this functionality. Oh, going next. Mm -hmm. 
I'm trying to use force here, but that doesn't seem to work. Does it go back? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, this is a, <laughs> this is not a slide I have. Although the sorry, <laughs> right. All right, thank you. Um, not sure if this is the next slide. Okay, so that should be the next one. Thank you. So um, Android UI Automator, under the hood, how does that work? Um, you see there are uh, roughly four pieces. Uh, the blue one is the test case that we have, is the test case that you will wrote if you're interested in developing a UI Automator test case. Um, the purple one is the application on a test, and the sort of orange, yellowish one is the UI Automator framework, and it has gained self. All right, never mind. So um, the one on the lower right corner is the Android framework. So the way it works is when you do a test invocation that's coming from ADB, stands for Android Debugging Bridge, it goes into UI Automator, it's a test runner, it loads the test cases, and it, the test cases then has a bunch of API calls, which goes into the UI Automator framework, and we channel the calls through to, over to Accessibility Manager to do UI inspection, and we talk to Input Manager uh, for event injection. Both of the, these lives inside the system server, which is part of the Android framework. And this, uh, in turn, talks to the application to do, you know, to check what's on your screen, what's on your screen, or uh, you know, click here, do a swipe, or press this button, um, something like that. So uh, now, as a package that we are presenting to the end user, this is what we are providing. First is the core framework, which is roughly outlined in the previous slide. Then we have the test runner. This works in a sort of JUnit 3 um, style. And we have a UR, UI Automator viewer tool which you should see next. Uh, it's a host side tool to let you inspect the uh, application under test UI. You will see what the test will be see, seeing at the runtime, so you can decide what widgets that you can look up and what widgets you can test against. And the next piece is SDK support. We have a end based build. We have some end script for you to create a empty UI test project and for you to build a test, and you can, the, the outcome of the test is a jar file. You push it and into the device, and you load it with the test runner to do the test execution. So with that, I'll hand it over to Adam. He will Thank go you. over with the details of the uh, core framework. Thank you. So how does the workflow look like? When I want to write an automated test, where do I begin, and how do I write this test? This is a very simple example. Um, we're going to show here how we uh, go through the UI Automator viewer so that we can identify various widgets on the screen and write a test against those widgets so we can automate them. In this example, all I want to do is launch an application. But the steps to launch the applications go through launching the All Apps first, which is that button. You can't see any text on it. It's just an image. Then once I land on the all apps, I want to ensure that I have apps selected in the tabs, not widgets. So I'm going to go ahead and click that. Then I'm going to look for my application that I want to launch. In this case, settings, and it doesn't look like it's available on this screen. So what I want is identify an area that I want my um, automator to swipe for me to find settings and launch it for me. So I identified here these three different controls. How do I proceed from here, since I have these controls? There is this tool that Wong put together for us. It helps us identify various widgets on the screen, what they, where they are in the layout, and what sort of properties they have on them. Um, whether the widget is, um, has content description, it is scrollable, it is long clickable, is it clickable? You can see all those properties for every widget that you hover your mouse over. Um, so let me see here, we can probably do an example. Can we switch to the laptop, please? So we, we, thank you. So we have 
the UI Automator viewer on the screen, we have a tablet connected. We're going to go ahead and sync an image from the device, and we're going to get the current layout hierarchy in the UI Automator viewer. Obviously, pulling images from the device is a little slow, but here we have it. So what we do now, if, we, if, we, if I move the mouse over any of those objects on the screen, you'll see that it's highlighting the layout for me, telling me what I'm looking at. If I go to this All Apps button, I'll see that it has content description apps. So the developers have labeled it for us, and this is good. All apps should have their content description for all their widgets already labeled for accessibility purposes, regardless if the app has a camera, video, whatever. Uh, users who are partially visually impaired or permanently or temporarily need to be able to use all apps. So we insist that um, the, our developers add these content descriptions everywhere. We miss few, but we're working on it. So um, back to the slides, please. So using this tool, we are going to identify these three controls. Now, how do we proceed with writing the tests? First, I need to find information about the widget that I want to automate. And I need to create a selector. The selector's job is to find it for me. Once I find it, I want to do some actions on it. I want to click it, maybe swipe it, pinch it, or read some properties off of it. That's the job of the UI object. Every UI object requires a selector so it can do its job. Then we have a couple of extra classes, the UI collection and UI scrollable. They're basically objects that can enumerate other objects on the screen. And I'll show you how we use one of them next. First is a good idea that we declare all of our objects ahead of time. And it's a better idea if we were to create sort of a, an intelligent class, a specialized class, for every application. If I have a Gmail, I may have a specialized class that knows how to return to me the various widgets on the screen for Gmail. This way, I can keep my tests separate from the declarations of those widgets. So if the UI changes, I don't have to chase down 600 different test cases and change um, the layouts in those. For sake of uh, an example here, I just put everything into one function. We have the four objects that I talked about. All apps button. We don't have text on it, so we have to use the description apps that we found in the UI Automator viewer. When we click, we're going to land on the all apps view, and we want to click the apps tab. That has text on it, so we tell the selector, just find anything that has apps for now and click on it. We can actually narrow the search even further. We can say um, text apps dot some class name if you want to get further into that, and you can specify what you're really looking for. And then we use a UI scrollable for the container that has all the various app applications. And we tell that container you are a horizontal list, meaning that if you have to scroll, do it horizontally, back and forth, until you find the object I'm asking you to find. Last thing, I need an object that I can use an assert on to make sure that settings actually launched. In this case, I'm going to tell the selector, find me anything that's on the screen that's coming from this package. And I will assert on that later to make sure that my application actually launched. That's, that's as simple as it gets. So the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to make sure I start from a common place. I'm going to grab a Get UI device, press home. That's going to set me at the home page. I'm going to grab the All Apps button, say click, followed by Apps tab click, followed by the list of apps. Find me a child that has the text settings that is a text view from this class. Notice we're not putting any sleeps or anything between these calls. The system is auto the framework is automatically synchronizing. It waits until the object is visible, then it proceeds to click it. Once I have the settings icon or the, the position for it scrolled and visible, 
I'm going to go ahead and click it, and then I'm going to assert that it actually launched. That's my test. It's done. So you notice we have few objects, UI object, that can take the form of any widget on the screen. Whatever selector you give it, it becomes that widget on the screen. So, and then we have a collection and a scrollable. UI collection, UI scrollable are the same thing. One scrolls, one doesn't. That's it. That's as simple as the API gets. You can quickly, without really knowing anything about the application, totally black box approach, begin to automate, leveraging all the ins, uh, accessibility information that should be already in the application. So with that, um, can we switch to the Wolf Vision here, please? Thank you. So we have a tablet here. And the, the, the use case we are trying to demonstrate is somewhat artificial, well, as in all test cases. Um, but basically, it's, uh, it's, it's about, let's say you really like a restaurant or a food place, and you uh, sort of find it on Google Maps, save it to the context, and later you pull it out, and maybe you want to have a meal there, and then you just try to find directions. and. Sorry, the screen goes in. So that's that's the case we're trying to cover here. We are driving it using UI Automator. Uh, here are my hands. I'm not on the on the device. So I'm just gonna kick off the test. And off it goes. So first it's gonna open up the apps menu, launch maps, and then find out what our current location is, and then goes and search a like uh, we, we kind of coded a search term that says pizza near Times Square. And there it goes. Um, Wi-Fi works great. Uh, we're lucky. And, or maybe the Wi-Fi is great. Uh, and it clicks the one that we are trying to find, John's Pizzeria. Save it to contacts. Down. Go back home. Launch apps again. And then pick out the contacts. And then pick out the address. Click on it. And it will launch Google Maps again. Focus on it. And it's trying to get directions. And since we are in New York City, it's trying to get transit directions. And there it is. Uh, we have a couple of options here. So uh, basically, uh, everything is written through UI Automator. And we are driving it with uh, this command line that we are seeing. Um, it's not a lot of lines of code. Uh, fortunately, unfortunately, I can't really show it here. So um, can we have the slides back, please? Thank you. All right, so um, with the demo, let's go on to the next one. Uh, life of UI test. So you've seen a live UI test in um, demonstration. Uh, how did we come up with it? Uh, what do you typically do when you, want, when you want to write a UI test? So we've already established that um, uh, basically most of the UI test cases that we found are uh, uh, a slightly modified version of existing menu test cases. Uh, modifying as in, you know, we try to add more uh, deterministic, deterministic into it, uh, try to make it more deterministic and uh, less, uh, you know, requires uh, kind of like human decision. Uh, and we try, try to break down large complex cases into smaller sections uh, with verification steps um, you know, just to make sure that, um, you know, because the longer uh, the longer it is, uh, the flaky, the, the more chances for flakiness that you will have. Um, the second one is inspect key faces of the app on the test with the viewer tool that we just demoed. Uh, typically, you go through the different screens that these apps are showing at different stages of your uh, test case and decide, uh, you know, I want to pick out these text boxes, click on the buttons. Uh, and all that, and maybe in some cases you you have to go back to the developer say that uh, this widget of yours cannot uh, be identified because it's missing text uh, text uh, a textual description or a content description, or uh, in a more complex case you are using a, a custom rendered widget and we see nothing inside it. So there might be some work coding work. Uh, involved to to add into the app to make it more 
um, friendly to your automation. And also, I want to just uh, stress this again. Um, th this will also make your uh, app more, more accessible. And the third step is um, set up a test project. And we have existing SDK tools to support that. And we have instructions up on the developer site, uh, which I will mention at the end. Uh, you set it up, and you line up the IDE, and you write, compile, and debug your tests. And also, we support the Android debugger. Uh, basically, you can start it with a debug flag. It will wait for a debugger to attach first, and you can step through your test cases and when you are doing test development to figure out if anything went wrong. So just to avoid using printf, I guess. Um, next step, profit. Uh, basically, you have your test lineup, and you should have increased automation power. And hopefully, this can streamline your development and test cycle. So uh, use cases. Uh, I've been talking about all these, and you might wonder what is Google or what is Android doing with this tool? Um, we, we've actually been running this for quite a while. Uh, we started off at, with ice cream sandwich, and, and, it, and we sort of run through a lot of internal vetting. Basically, you know, we have this new tool. We have this new approach. Works great, but is it stable? Uh, can it get what we wanted? And uh, does it, is it friendly for the end user? Can, can, can this be done on any uh, production devices? Meaning you buy a phone that is ginger jelly bean or late, later, and can you, can you run tests on it? And that sort of thing. So bottom line is we've done a lot of testing, uh, internal trials with this already. Uh, so we find it useful in three main categories. First is uh, f targeted uh, for app developers. Um, it's useful for application functional testing. Um, you, uh, as I said, you uh, have your menu cases, and you can try to automate it with the UI automator tool, and uh, to basically get rid of some of the highly repetitive but important cases that you want to cover, uh, or um, you know you can uh, it, it, with. Based on how, how accessible your app is, uh, you can deploy more complex cases. Um, at this point, it's really your choice to like how, how, how much you want to automate, uh, because there's a cost benefit there. Um, that's a different topic, but basically, that's what we are trying to do with application functional testing. The second point that we are trying to do is more targeted for platform bring up uh, system smoke tests. Um, I have a new build of the. I have a new device build out. Um, is it safe to put it onto my device for me to try it out? Uh, how do I, how do I have a some pre preliminary level of confidence that this is good enough? Uh, this is what we do with your automator tool. Basically, we go through the app drawer and do a uh, basically do a round robin of all the apps, launch all, uh, one, one of them at a time, and make sure uh, they don't crash. Um, launch them, play with them a little bit, and make sure there are no crashes or there are no bad things going on, and you know, move on to the next app. Um, by that, we can establish some minimal level and quick assessment of uh, what's the state of this build is. Um, the third one is also kind of for, um, well, it's the third one is both for app development and, um, and um, system level testing, uh, bring up, uh, platform bring out level testing. It's for stability. Basically, uh, you can do some sort of um, uh, random, randomized uh, UI events testing. Uh, you, but I, I guess some of you might be familiar with Monkey. Monkey sends out uh, random events without verification. Uh, what we are trying to do here is trying to be smarter than the monkey tool. Uh, we make informed decisions on which widget to click on, and we uh, and on a more advanced level, we choose to remember what steps we have gone through, and you know, what, maybe which screens uh, we have visited, and. Uh, to to basically flush out uh, some of the stability issues because one of the the top complaints we get for monkey is these steps are looks like humanly impossible or 
uh, not a real use case, something like that. Well, with UI Automator Tool, guess what? Um, you know, we are doing things at uh, close to manual speed, and your app should not behave badly. Um, the other thing that we used is uh, also during device spring up, we may run into graphical and underlying system level issues, and you can use simple repetitive steps to bring it out, but I, no one wants to sit there for, let's say, two hours repeating the same steps until you see an artifact or you see something bad happening on the device. Uh, that's also what we used, and it's been proven pretty useful. Um, this is not really a roadmap, more like upcoming features. Uh, I've mentioned a couple of these, kind of hinted of these uh, yesterday at launch, uh, at launch roundtable discussion. First is we want to do an instrumentation, uh, integration with instrumentation framework. So currently it's running as a shell user. That's how we get our security guarantee. Basically, your, when you run a test, you assume the identity of a shell user. You can poke at the apps and, uh, as you want it. So instrumentation framework, as I mentioned earlier, is targeted for apps, really. However, because it's also launched from shell, uh, we can basically uh, use that angle to uh, sort of say that since you are launching from shell, we have this trust in you, and you will be able to in 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 get a sort of a privileged token for you to do UI inspection and key injection. Uh, and this also has a benefit of your app will become a, your, your test will become a real app, and you can sort of also mix and match with the real instrumentation approach. Uh, this is basically up to your decision. Um, and, and also, a lot of people have been asking this. I want, can I get a context object from your test? Right now, not really, but once you are running as an instrumentation, you are a legitimate app inside the system, so you will have access to all that. Uh, with behind that, there's a plethora of uh, system services in, you can reach into. So two is faster iteration as unbundled test library. Basically, we are using, we will be using all public APIs soon, and this means we can actually sort of unbundle ourselves off the platform and the test library itself sort of becomes like a real library that, that has uh, specified stated API level dependency. So the third one we are doing is improved UI widget lookup. Basically, we're trying to exclude, optionally exclude some of the components that are not interesting for, uh, for UI automation perspective, like layout components. I'm not really interested in that. I'm interested in things with text on it or with content description on it. So by simplifying the, the UI tree that we are exposing, uh, we should be able to do faster widget lookups. So that actually kind of, uh, I don't know why I put the force point in there. It's basically the, 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 the same thing that we are covering here. Uh, all right. So more information. Uh, we have a kind of like a landing page for UI testing. This is on developer end android.com and if you're interested feel free to search or just search android ui automator i think the first hit will be the landing page and with that uh, q a yes uh thank you gone <laughs> thank you adam yeah i have to say when i was uh watching the the demo i i got thinking of this area of computer science it's called pessimal algorithms has anybody ever heard of this this is where computer scientists try to find the most inefficient way of doing something without duplicating work. They figured out how to do like an n cubed sort. Um, and so in this one, as I was watching, I was like, well, just click the directions button. No, we went back through the contacts and all the way back to the directions. So um, you may have a career in pessimal algorithms. <laughs> uh, on a more serious note, though, uh, one thing you gave us all a reminder on was accessibility. Um, you had mentioned this in the middle of the talk. This is a really important topic for all of us. Is how do we make all of our applications and devices very accessible to everybody? So thank you for that reminder. Um, with that, we'll take uh, probably two questions. Um, and then I'll give you a rundown of what's going to happen in the afternoon. And then I will um, let everybody go have lunch, because man, that food smells really delicious. So uh, the catering department has outdone themselves this time. Um, so with that, first question, please. Um, so I saw you had no, si uh, no slide on known limitations. Uh, what can you not do with it? Um, so 
like I explained at the beginning, so the, 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 the thing we are, so the problem we are to solve, trying to solve is really UI interaction and, uh, sorry, UI inspection and event injection. That, that's, a, that's basically the, the APIs that are centered around. Anything outside it, we see it as, uh, you know, not a problem that we are trying to address. Um, you know, I don't know if that sort of answers your question, or if you have anything specifically in mind. I was referring to multi-touch or like uh, device rotation and stuff like that. Oh. Uh. Well, um, yeah, that would be my fault. I didn't talk too much about the rest of the APIs. Um, on the get UI device, the UI device object has all those APIs on it. You could uh, rotate the device in any direction during testing. You can query to see which uh, current position the device is in. You can also um, do multi-touch. Um, you could do multi-pointer multi-touch. You know, I mean, just five, six, ten fig fingers or two or swipe out and pinch. We have all these APIs already built in to um, make it possible to do everything that the user could do. Uh, I, I just want to add one more point out. Those are uh, upcoming features. That's actually the one I was, I was trying to li list, but I forgot. Yeah. Okay, so great. Th there is some multi-touch multi already in the previous, I think, API 17, but we've enhanced additional APIs in 18 going forward. And the rotation is already there, I guess, right? Uh, yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, we have time for one more question. And then one thing I'll mention is we have a ton of questions that are up on moderator. We're going to ask all the speakers after the conference is over and they get a break for a day. Um, as the rest of the questions had come in the moderator, they'll go answer the questions there too. So um, don't feel like we, we we're going to skip it. Um, and they'll, the speakers will also be here afterwards. So one more question, please. Yeah. So uh, I'm Joe Kozla from Bitbar. So uh, we are actually great fans of uh, your framework. So you have been able to run uh, UI automator tests on the real devices on Testroid Cloud since December already. So, and, and we're seeing uh, people actually doing it. So uh, one question is that, uh, will you guys support web views? Uh, because that's, that's kind of the modern apps use, use a lot of those. Uh, and also, uh, before you answer, uh, I have a demo of a visual recorder that outputs uh, UI automator code, including all the swipes and drags and, and all that. And I'm demoing it in the corner here here, so anyone yes. who wants to take a look, just uh, nice. come over here. Thank you. Um, so, uh, on specifically web view, web view falls into the category of um, customized views that I just talked about. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have any uh, accessibility provider to specifically tackle that problem yet. Uh, I th think there are wor there are things in the work, but uh, I don't think I can say when or any more specifics about that. Because uh, it's not within my team, I don't want to, you know, uh, I, I know about it, but I don't want to say, uh, provide like more specific about, yeah. All right, thank you guys. Um, so some quick announcements I'm gonna move into. So you guys, thank you. Thank you.